weigh in, so um, we may as well get started. It's we got another 6 hour uh, uh, we'll, we'll get Susan another 30 seconds, too. Okay, 30 seconds. Do have a quorum. It's, it's real well related. At least. Oh. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Does anybody have a copy of the agenda? I know there were two. Um, there were two additions that Jeremy had emailed us about. Um, so we'll just presume that those are on the agenda, and he can take them up uh, wherever he feels that that's appropriate. And was there another? Did you have I'm one of those items. Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other changes, additions? No, hearing none. Uh, public comment. Is there any public, first of all, to, to be able to comment? No. Um, boy, we're moving right along. We may get done before Jeremy gets here. Um, that would be good. Treasurer's report. He's not here. Nathan's not here. Wow. So. It's all the way up to you, Susan. Clark for <laughs> Okay, I give just me a minute to get up to date here. Uh, no treasurer's report. Okay. Uh, quick report. Um, Crazy. Some of you will be happy to know this that I am working on your October me meeting minutes. Um, I did this the first meeting, yeah, the first meeting first, and it was five pages long. Uh, I think I probably detailed too much of what Carol was talking about, so I'm going to have to trim that down a little bit before I present it to you. So it's a work in progress. Okay. Um, also, the second meeting you had in October, I have not started the meetings about the minutes, but I will complete those minutes. And I, I thank Orca for being here and allowing me to look at their. Um, their film online, um, get the minutes. So if anybody's really interested in what really happened and they want to rewind that, go on the ORCA yeah. um, website and it's, it's there, you can find it. That's yeah, because five pages is way too much. My, our town clerk would re refer to that as meeting hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I, I, I refer to it as my excessive minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, did you get extra copies? So yep. Oh, thank you. Anybody else need a copy thank of the you. agenda? Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Yes? Okay. Well, come on up. <laughs> I need to walk in Don't front of the afraid. camera. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. You want to get there? No, thank you. Um, Okay, um, I, I have not completed the registration, um, but it's in the, it's in the works. Um, I, I have chosen a P.O. box in East Collins, and uh, numerically it, it, it's CV, which is, uh, uh, numerically is 28, so only P.O. box 28. So if you forget the P.O. box number, just remember to it's number one. They, they um, and I have not signed any papers for them yet, although it's ready to file, because I had a budget of $75, and they want $96, no, $92 plus $6 for the, for the two keys. So I'm coming to you uh, to request a motion that you approve um, up to $100, and it will be $98, up to $100 uh, for the box. And I've got to get that right away because the, the PO boxes are going to be in, in increasing very soon. So I will be doing that in the next 24 hours if I get approval um, for an increase up to $75, up to, up to $100. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank Aye. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back to you. Okay. I will bring up the invoices and everything like that. The um, SOS registration should have happened. Well, well, point of order: there was a motion and a second. Oh, so if there's okay. any if there's any further discussion about authorizing up to $100, uh, I think it was made by John, John seconded by Siobhan. Okay. Anything else on that? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Okay, you have approval for the December minutes down here. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else to say um, under the clerk's report unless there's questions. Okay. 
We skipped over treasurer. He skipped over treasurer. Okay, he should he should be here. That's what um, I, and I, I can also give the treasurer's report uh, to a certain extent. Um, did we do additions or changes to the agenda? Um, only to add the ones. That the, the you had that mentioned. I mean. Yeah. Great. And um, we said you'll put them wherever you feel works best. Okie dokie. Um, so let's let's do um, the quick discussion about the Vista uh, AmeriCorps Vista volunteer uh, possibility. Let me go to this. Um, I learned today. Hold on a second. Of course, I'm not currently connected. Let's try this again. No internet. Lovely. Um, so the, I got an email from the person at the state whose name eludes me, um, who organizes, runs the, the VISTA program. And they said that it would require a, a staff person to do oversight. And it would also cost three or $4,000 plus mileage. Um, so my, my instinct is that we don't have one person that's going to be responsible for doing that, and we also um, don't have the four thousand dollars to pay this person to do whatever it is that we want them to do. Interesting idea. Next year. Next year, or if there's something that you know Valley Net or, or someone maybe at the state wants to do to help us. Yeah, I, d I just don't. Yeah, full inventory would be would, would be an amazing opportunity. So so maybe Washington Electric can you know can look at doing that, and that could be something um, they could do. Um, any other thoughts about about that, or am I off base? What's the schedule? Um, application deadline is March third, and I, I, I have the I have the packet here, and I think I forwarded the mm -hmm. I think I forwarded the email around too. So um, we can still come back to it. Um, letter of intent deadline is February seventh. So if we did think that we wanted to do this, we would have to declare that intent rather soon. So, so shall we move on from that? Or if somebody gets a, a, a brilliant idea um, of how we might use this person, why it might be valuable, let's, um, let's visit I have, that. I have a dim time. idea, which yes. is you know, I'll talk to um, our public service department community guy, who I know, thanks, Cameron's name. Um, to see, the, I think that poll inventory would be interesting. Maybe you know, work among several of the communities um, just to give people a sense of what that. Anyway, I was talking to see yeah, if they're interested, but they'll do it. I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think if somebody's doing the poll inventory, I think that makes sense for us to yeah. chip in to do that. Yeah. And if WEC wants to chip in to do that, and whoever, they may have somebody to manage it. Right, yeah. and that would be good, Michael. Okay. So. Um, I'm, I'm having a meeting with uh, Robin as well. Um, one of the rules is that the, the VISTA volunteer cannot supplant somebody who would otherwise be hired to do whatever the task is. So we have to be careful if we do it, that we propose a project that can't be construed as something that we would have hired someone for. Okay, which I, I suppose it, it is going to happen eventually, that full inventory right? has to happen. That's we can rationalize that we would have done it with volunteers. <laughs> that's true. We, we would not likely have paid someone, someone, or maybe we would, but I think that's hard to say. But if you want to follow up with them and see yeah, we'll if, that's, if, there, if that makes sense, then I think that's, that's something that I, I could certainly get behind. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I will take over Treasurer's report for Nathan. Um, we went to VSCCU and um, added, so we removed Becca, added Nathan and me as signatories. At the same time, we also removed Rama. In order to add him, he would have had to physically be present. We can add him later. Um, it is possible to do that. But given that he's um, busy with his own stuff down in Williamstown, I'm going to bet <coughs> that uh, he's probably, probably OK with this. Um, the online donation site, um, as I recall, did, you, you didn't get access to this. I think Nathan was given access by Elliot. Elliot Bent had the um, kind of ultimate credentials for the, uh, what the heck is the name of the site that used Snowflake. Um, 
handed those credentials over to Nathan, I believe um, Nathan is also depositing some checks that we have. So but I don't have balances uh, because he hasn't uh, he hasn't made me an authorized user on the ESCCU uh, online banking yet. Any other questions, treasurer related? I don't. I don't have. I mean, it hasn't. It hasn't really changed much, aside from a couple donations of uh, less than two hundred dollars, and then the uh, twelve thousand five hundred for the Think Vermont um, Innovation Grant. Okay. When? How do we get paid from USDA? We have to file a reimbursement claim. And we that. can't do that until. Yeah. We can't do that until we've spent money beyond what we said our matching part was going to be. So with the report that I'm submitting um, tonight or tomorrow, with um, your in-kind report, David, and um, I don't know that there's much else that we can claim at this point. Um, when we get to the um, consultant status, which is momentarily, we'll, we'll talk about um, that schedule, how we're going to pay for that, and uh, the USDA is certainly going to come into going to come in as part of that. Okay. Anything else? Anything else about the treasurer's report? I have it kind that I've done as well. Oh. Okay. But that was and that was something that we had inventoried as part of the part of the USDA grant so that we could sort of fill in as survey hours? Yeah, it was me doing survey hours is exactly what it was. Perfect. Um, would you would you forward her your yeah. template and if you can just fill out like what he has and then I will put both of those together. Okay. The um, like tomorrow would be good because there because yeah. the, the report I have to submit is due tomorrow. Okay. Um, it's, a, and it's the quarterly report for, from the fourth quarter of 2019. So if you've done stuff in this calendar year, that will be included in the next report ending March 31st. You look like you might have questions. So I did it in September. It would be January. Survey right. Okay, so so we can we can include those hours. They're just not going to show up in the in the report that I'm putting there. I'll just mention that we didn't have we didn't have the receipts. Um, it, it, it makes it, it makes sense. We'll, okay. But just date it for whatever whatever the date is. The date is also in Little Green Life, and you have access to Little Green Life, where you have had access. To it. Okay. I, but I, I need a letter from you. Oh, sure. oh okay. I need a letter from you. Okay, you send like, me the template. I'll get it out. You'll have it tomorrow. Yes, because it, it has to look like you're a contractor. And you said, I did this work this number of hours, and cool. your hourly rate is this. And so we're charging that to our in kind expectation. I even have a DBA I can put that on. If, if you like. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Treasurer's Report related? <laughs> okay. Let's um, move along. Um, consultant status. Contract signed. It is, right? Wow. Here. There it is. Um, it's signed. Um, there was a bit of a, a bit of back and forth, and thank you to everybody for the feedback that you gave. I think it made it it made it uh, better than it was, and I I'm hoping that everybody's more comfortable with um, what our results are going to look like. Um, than you were feeling maybe at the beginning of the process. Maybe, maybe not, but if we, get, if we got closer anyways, maybe that's, that's best. One of, the, one of the things that we changed was we, uh, we asked the payment schedule to be done by milestones rather than blocks of hours. They were not willing to, they were not willing to um, only take $30,000 from the DPS grant at the end of three months of work. They said that was too long to go without being paid. And that made sense. We have the cash flow. We can pay for it. Um, we can get the reimbursement through USDA. It, it's not going to be a problem. I'm going to have to sit down with Nathan and figure out how we're going to do the accounting. Um, but um, I'll just re read off the, the payment schedule. So we have all, all the weeks, estimated hours, whatever. Uh, the first milestone invoice of 14000 will be payable upon presentation of a preliminary route analysis and fiber map, roughly upon completion of week six of the work schedule. 
So um, when we tell them to go, which I'm guessing will be end of this week, uh, beginning of next week, so six weeks from that, we will have something in our hands and then they will bill us and we'll have a month to write them a check. The second milestone invoice of 21,000 will be payable upon completion of the feasibility study. So this is the actual, no joke, feasibility study that we then hand off to Vermont DPS and they then tell us, is this good? Is, that, is this something that's gonna show us that you should proceed to a business plan? If they say yes, then the next stage happens. Uh, the third milestone payment of $10,000 will be in, um, invoiced upon completion of the business plan, high level engineering and cost estimation task, and the market analysis task, roughly week 18 of the work schedule. So we're gonna have some concrete things in our hands that we will be able to see, that we will be able to write them checks for. And then the remainder will be invoiced upon completion of the final deliverable. That's a not to exceed 58,220. What if they say no? Then we stop. <laughs> it's all done. Um, well, th then we stop with then we stop getting money from DPS, and we will have to look at how we're going to fund the rest. We we probably have the funding to finish and do the business the business plan. I, I'm thinking that would be a pretty bad scenario, given that Vita is going to be looking to DPS for guidance on whether or not to accept our application for the loan. But might they say might they say no because the uh, not enough evidence there. They haven't. They they ought to get this, this, and this, and then we'll consider it again. So and if th they do that, what? And we say go do this. Um, are we saying that we're not accepting that work product such that you have to go? Out, you haven't complied. And you have to go out and finish it, and we're not going to pay you anymore. Oh oh oh! If if Interrail doesn't get it done, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's it? that that language is in there. I mean, so so the and even the most re, even the, the first copy of, of the contract that you have, or the first edits, I think I sent, actually had that as an expectation, that um, and the language that you suggested, the, the the warranty. Yeah. And that we're not yeah we're not going to pay unless it satisfies the requirements. This is this is the agreement that I've not yet signed with DPS. So merely the deliverable isn't, doesn't uh, trigger the payment, nope. it's the acceptance? Correct. Okay, so if it's not accepted and they say we need A, B, and C, uh, additional data or something to do this? They will fix it. Okay. Um, any other questions about this? I'm happy to, happy to hand this out. This is, my, this is my original that I scanned. If you can send it. Sure. Um, I have a um, I have a scanned version I can send along to. Um, just, should I just send it to everybody? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is that um, proprietary to the board, or is it a public document? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I ha I have to imagine that it would be public. Yeah. What do you think? Yep. I mean, I so. so yeah, who's doing a review of the contract and making a determination about what's confidential, what is it, and what will be published? There was not. There was nothing on there that strikes me as confidential on our part. I mean, and we, we as a municipality, must err on the side of openness. Um, the question that I always put to the contract is, what what do you propose to be confidential? And then there's a discussion about uh, whether there's agreement on that. It could be as a municipality, where we obviously are hard over with regard to certain things, but there might be other things that we can, and so that's the approach that. So, so let me let me flip that back. You sure. then, what do you think should be confidential? I don't have I don't have an answer for that. I haven't studied the contract, but I but I would you got, ask you got a copy them. Of the contract though. Yeah, you yes, read I it. Studied the contract. What I would say to you is I would I would ask them. Do you believe there's anything here that's confidential? No, they, they, confidential. they said explicitly that there was nothing in there that they felt was confidential. No problem. Okay. Well, what about confidential for us? In other words, they start providing specific routing, and Comcast and Consolidated get that. Uh, we're just talking about just the contract. No, I know. The deliverables, though. Do we Are we clear now as we start thinking about getting deliverables? I think I think those are. I think we will have to designate those as proprietary trade secrets, and withhold those from from public records requests. Should should someone come and ask for that? Should we do that now? 
We don't, we don't have the documents in question. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not really sure that that makes sense at this point. Or, Alan, I see you win wincing back yeah, there. Good work. Do that. No. You can't declare something on closed record if you don't have the record. Right. Okay. Yeah. But so, but but in terms of like op open. Um, not open meetings, public records requirements. What do you think about declaring something like that that's clearly proprietary? Yeah, I mean, there, there are all sorts of exemptions that exist already. There are over, they're over 240, I think, is the last count. And the ones around proprietary information, as you can probably guess from the fact the utilities in the state are, guard their secrets very closely, they're pretty robust. And it'd be hard not to find something that you can uh, just to have as justification for withholding information that seems it would be proprietary and to our disadvantage if it were disclosed. Okay. And, and we could conceivably wait until we until we got a request before we would have to we would have to say no. This is this is that. I was just agreeing that we need to consider all of this proprietary. We've got Comcast coming into East Montpelier promising to be. Oh, cool. My coworker has it. And he's like, yeah, it's good. They've replaced the wiring in this house, and they say they're replacing the wiring on his lines. Hmm. Very interesting. So, yeah, it's proprietary. So, so the, the comment you just made with regard to, um, we can just withhold it in, in, until we get a request. Uh, the default is transparency. Mm -hmm. and, and the default is publishing it on the website. That's not true. No? Municipalities don't publish all of their public records on the website. They publish things like minutes agendas, and those are things that we should do. But for example, um, emails between select board members and town managers, town administrators, those are public records. They don't make it a habit, though, of publishing those to the website. That's just not something that they do. Well, I, I'm also in, of the mind that you don't do it until you actually get the material. So I got a hypothetical for you. I mean, so we're going to get service territories to find prioritized. Mm -hmm. We want to sell this service to customers who are on those first lines. How do you let somebody on that route know, hey, we're going to come in the next year if it's proprietary? Well, the, but the, 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 the whole package is proprietary, but it's how we deliver, how we do that communication. It's just, just pretty hard to do both. So I, I would just say that once we get the documents, we should look them over. If we think there's anything proprietary, in them, right. we should declare them proprietary before there's any request. <laughs> because if we wait until a request, then it looks like we're doing cover-up stuff. And okay. It, it doesn't smack good. That's yeah. That's what I think. Jeff? Yeah. Okay. I think one thing you want to be very careful about, you can't declare an entire document off limits. The no, I, yeah. The even default, if it's a contract? The default is you have to you have to treat as an open record all the information that's in there except what you think is exempt because okay. of a specific exemption in the public records law. So you can't just say you can't have the document. You can say you can have the document, redacted. but there are going to be parts of it redacted. So we should study that 270 exemptions <laughs> in advance. Yes, yeah, probably so. The, 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 the carve-out that we have to use in question, I, I, I did go and review those a year and a half ago for for reasons related to uh, someone who was making such requests. Um, and it was really trade secrets. That was the one that, that these sorts of proprietary information that they fell under. And so there are a lot, but there are really specific carve-outs for certain kinds of data, many of which don't really, don't really apply to us. OK. Um, any other questions about the about the contract or trial moving forward? Good work. Okay. Um, let's go to a survey results update. Okay. Um, I handed out the latest, greatest. Um, I, handed it. I thought Ray, you probably didn't see what Ray sent out in Northfield. You don't live in Northfield, but um, it worked. Um, <laughs> I forget, you want to double it. doubled it. It was a great one, a great um, caption on Trump Bush for us because they were so low. Um, I put it out in the, um, in Callis, I put out, I prefaced the subject with urgent <laughs> and, and CV5 or update. Uh, and I ended up with another 40. So it does work. So now Callis is number two. Middlesex is still leading. 
<laughs> but I'm going to send it out. Okay, later. all right, all right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. And, and the, uh, we're really ending, I think, January 26th will probably be the, the last time I am ever going to go into this database. <laughs> 24th or 26th? Yeah, two, Tw I don't have. Yeah. Which one? Are, oh, yeah, one was a Friday, one was a Sunday. That's why I couldn't make up my mind. <laughs> so, so related to this, I dropped off physical copies up in Elmore. And then I forgot um, which other towns had asked me to do this, but I know I had, uh, I was going to drop some off in Orange, so I dropped them off over there, and those had your name on it. And then it wasn't until I got back and I read my, um, I read my notes that I realized it was, I was supposed to be dropping stuff off in Marshfield. I was like, I know it was somewhere up in the Northeast. I dropped them off in Cabot instead. <laughs> We're doing good in Cabot. How did you spot us? So um, I'm, I, I'm happy. I can send you the PDF, Jonathan, if you want to print them out and drop them off over there. I, yeah, that's fine. That's okay. fine, Jeremy. Um, I mean, the big news of the takeaway of this, you know, the uptick in, in some of these towns is just the definitely wood, 50%. That's gone up. And then the uh, probably wood, 39 So that's 89%. And I don't know, someplace I've heard through the middle of rumors that um, based on what people said they're going to do, you probably get half of that. Right. <laughs> so we're at 45 or something in that neighborhood. No, just for our feasibility study for the business plan, I think it's looking pretty good. So anyway, that's my, my take on that. Um, I did send out everybody their own data from through to uh, January 8th. When we finish, I'll send out everybody's own town's records. And Siobhan, you're going to deal with the fundraising yeah, part I, of it? I'm waiting until we get all, all of that, that because the, the batch upload is going to be smelly. Okay. So. Uh, and since our data set, what uh, data I'll set is it in a different source, you'll do that? Bring it in, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. What do we, what will we like be able to feed back when, we're, like, when we close it? I would like to be able to follow up and say, are we going to like have a genericized, friendly, not too detailed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> then we can put it on the website. Yeah, yeah. Too. Okay. That's, that's yeah. And, and yeah, a lot of people have done a lot of work to build this. And, and, and we also we also have budget, at least in the USDA projects, we have budget to actually do outreach. And so if we wanted to send a mailer to people, we could do that. We will likely still have money in the budget to do that. So the only community that I never really got much traction on was the business community. Um, and then last week, I was able to download from a database the business addresses for the 18 communities, which is probably like 75 percent of the businesses, something like 800 of them. So I have all the business addresses. I have um, the number of employees and how much revenue they take in every year. <laughs> but you can tell that it's missing quite a few, but it's still pretty pretty decent. The numbers that I put in here, the the they, I'm prepared. I basically, this is preparing for the consultant, um, is where I'm started. Um, the number of businesses listed in the second page by town, I think, probably pretty accurate. It's coming from a different data source. Um, anyway. Um, I have a question about that. Jeremy, I understand um, through communications with Joel Schwartz of Barry Area Development that you had spoken with him, and I wonder if this is a good intersection with his group because mm -hmm. I know he he reached out to me at the food bank because he was surveying the Wilson Industrial Park businesses and some of those businesses um, have issues with internet speed um, and I just wonder if we could make that connection somehow them working with this distributing this survey to businesses at least I mean those are some pretty significant businesses in that area Vermont Creamery um, Okay, you're alive. Did put it out in one of the newsletters. So, if so, I send yeah. you, if I send you the paper copies of the survey, can you follow up with with, with Joel? him, yeah. with Joel, and see if yeah. he can get that out to his members? Sure. Um, and if we find that there is a kind of a, a hotbed of interest, he he suggested that there was a hotbed of interest. There is there, there and that matches. they um, that they were likely to be a nice, easy to serve cluster right there. Yeah. Um, that's also something that if we have that data, then I can hand that to Interisle, and that can be part. Of the part of the package of the feasibility study. It's only a few miles from my house. Yeah, so. Okay. So page three on this thing is I actually like you spent a number of hours trying to sort out by town the number of types of premises in each town. And so the numbers you see on the front page, the total premises are only for those first four categories. Um, 
Yeah, the first. Are there any extras of this for your room? No, I didn't. There's um, one here. Would, would you hand it to the union Young back there? Or, I, I've got one. I guess so. Thank you. Um, and so the numbers of premises for household surveys, I adjusted downward to okay. fit the non-business ones because we didn't survey them. And um, so anyway, I may have made up a mistake here. Anyway, I'll fix that later. So yeah, that was a bit of work using the E911 database by structure type, which isn't accurate. You'll see some towns don't have town offices, and they do. I mean, they're not listed as a town office. I also just wanted to mention that every time I send this out on front porch forum, I get a contact from Washington, and it's usually a different person. And I got another contact from Washington, and I explained what it was, and I offered to go to the select board with the person and said that they were welcome to come to our meetings as well. So I just wanted to let you know that Washington, there's people in Washington, but the select board still hasn't done anything as far as I'm able to tell. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of, they kind of need. And so to pivot a little bit, did you talk to Groton? Oh, yes, that was, that was another thing. I was gonna ask Michael if he'd be willing to go to their select board meeting on Thursday. <laughs> because they're they're likely to be part of that same CUD as Craftsbury. Yeah, their their only concern, and the guy that I keep talking to, his concern is just how far south they are from every all the other communities, and they feel very isolated, and they're very concerned that that means they're not going to get served in anything like they're a real thing. Part of the Peach and Barnett group. Yeah, see, that's why I wanted you to go, because I don't know the area, and I don't know what's going Is on. Is doing one, too? Not yeah. yet, but they will. They'll all join. Uh, they I, should I think the, the, the guy from... What's his name? Evan. Evan Carlson is probably the one to approach them. So, so, so they, I mean, they, they have it on their town meeting warning already to, jo to join the other, to join the Northeast Kingdom CUD. Mm -hmm. it's our, it's our, they already have that, but I think what Siobhan's saying is that they're feeling like they're going to be in, they're going to be an outlier with that group. Right. And they're going to be an outlier with our group. We're just farther along. Right. Well, and they border Marshall and Cabot. We have, yeah. they have two contiguous. Complaints. So, so it's, it's, it's contiguous, but, but they're contiguous with but each a mountain, too. There's a mountain range in the way. Right? Oh, yeah. I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> just oh. one small thing. No, yeah. I mean, they better. They would be better off with Peach and Barnett. I would assume. You know, all well, pull, pull wise, because I think there's only one road in. Yeah, no, yeah. It's it's, it's, and it's it's not really it, this time of year. It's not even. There's not even a pull around the whole way. Yeah, yeah. That road, so. Right. so I will talk to the town planner. Is the one who's been contacting right. me because we work in the same building. Okay. So I will talk to him again, and I'll I will say that he needs to talk to um, what's his name? Evan Carlson. Maybe. Yeah. Um, Send me a message. I'll see if I can do it. Dan, is Dan Will talking about Peach and Barnett too? Is that what so, so oh, the, there, there was a there was a map. I think it was it was put together by Digger. Did BT Digger do that? Digger ran it. Yeah, that, that was NEK Collaborative sent stuff to Digger. So it's it's Catherine Sims that has all that stuff. But but somebody had created like a Google map overlay that yeah. had flags so, on, on each town. Uh, uh, yeah, it had flags in each town that had it on their town meeting ballot yeah, already. Right. That's, yes. that's Catherine, I think. So, yeah, did, I saw yeah, that. So, that was, oh, I mean, so, somebody sent see that see to me. I don't remember who it was. I know. Okay. Or you, Evan Carlson. We both Carl. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll wait for his uh, Any Anything else about the survey, David? Thank you. I don't know. Google do not cohort. Any, any questions mm -hmm. about this, the Google survey? Google do not cohort. Um, my do, do not. I sent out a front porch forum thing, and I, and I put it on Sunday, so it showed up on <laughs> yeah. Monday. Today's Tuesday. And prior to this, I had something like 85 responses. I now have 170 responses for that one that one front porch forum. Oh, the, 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 the subject line. The subject line. The subject line was only five percent Northfield won high speed internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it was. Now it's nine point eight, but it was four point eight or four point nine. I mean, it basically doubled. And, and I explained that we're hiring a consultant, and they'll be they'll be prioritizing areas for development. And one major factor is a level of interest in high-speed broadband. Ooh. And it's like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. You know, and boom. So I'll probably do this one more time, but I'll say it, it's now 10%. I also said there were there were communities that were approaching 20% and over. And so you're only at five. So I'd be happy to share the email. 
Yeah, would, you do, would you do that? Would you do that? That's great. <laughs> Okay. Any other anything else on the survey? That's awesome. Okay. Let's go on to a business development committee update. This is David. This is you again. Yes. Um, we had a meeting scheduled for last Thursday night in which we did not have a quorum, so I have nothing to report. Okay. <laughs> So it was a very productive. It was a very productive discussion. Did you guys warn it? I didn't yes. see a warning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Um, so this is a logical place to segue, I think, into talk of a communications committee. Chuck, do you want to take that? Sounds good. Um, one of the discussion items we had the other night was um, about people's thoughts on a communications committee <coughs> and uh, whether it, this might be the right opportunity to put that out. Uh, it seemed like other members of the business development committee felt that that was a smart thing to do at this point in time. Um, and so uh, we'd like to propose going ahead and establishing this committee. Um, I have drafted some language as to an actual motion of how to proceed on this. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to see how people felt about it and, and gather feedback. Strongly in favor. Uh, we have to we have to uh, establish messages. We need to do kind of uniformly what we're sending out. And at some point in time, we're actually going to be doing campaigns, and that requires a steady stream of messaging with a proper theme. And uh, so I think that we really need to have a committee that's going to work on that. Okay. Should it be a committee, or should we just get help? <laughs> a meeting only, you know, marketing because that there is a there is a skill set there to it, you know. So agreed. And my thought process on that is, even if there were a determination that it's worth going out and getting outside help, particularly on day to day performance marketing and stuff like that, um, which I do know a bit about, by the way, so I can hack it, but an agency probably makes sense at some point in time. Um, managing the relationship sure. of that kind of agency is still a fair amount of work, and so a committee probably still makes sense even in that respect. So ideally we'd have at least five people to be part of that. Who's, uh, who's going to serve on that? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we got five, good enough. Susan, do you get those? Things? Yeah, I'd like to. Okay. Sure. Well, I mean, did you right. catch the names? Do you want me to write them down? Oh, oh would you please? <laughs> so, so, well, we, we can make it part of the motion if you want. So why don't you keep your keep your hands up? And uh, so I see. Just read them off to me. Uh, Andy Gilbert, Jeremy Matt. Andy, Jeremy. Ray Pelletier. David, you had your hand up, right? Yep. David Healy. Michelle Burt. Who did I miss? Me. Okay. okay. So we have six, which makes a, a quorum of three. The reason we wouldn't want to have less than five is then a quorum of two. You don't want to send emails to each other then. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, just a couple other points I want to bring up. I was not going to make these part of the official motion. The official motion is going to have some of the immediate activities that I envisioned that we would tackle. Um, but some other future endeavors we may tackle, uh, as deemed appropriate by the board, um, seeking community testimonials and quotes about CV fiber to be used in grant applications, um, pitching and pit actually seeking to pitch press interviews rather than just being reactive toward uh, press inquiries. And so forth. Uh, and one other important element here for those who are raising their hands, um, I am envisioning that members of this board would have a responsibility to attend, uh, this committee would have a responsibility to send a representative to other committees um, in order to help them bridge communication challenges. Um, so it may involve some meetings for those involved. 
I didn't mean, hear you mention, but uh, I think we want to consider it also for the social media. Yep, that, that's in the official motion. Oh, should I go ahead and read the official motion at this point? Which has like the, 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 the charge for the committee and yep, such? Absolutely. Go for it. Okay, uh, I move to establish a communications committee. The charge of the communications committee is to aid CV Fiber as an entity, the governance board, and other subcommittees in ensuring CV Fiber maintains uniform, accurate, and timely messaging with the general public. Immediate activities would consist of helping draft and distribute press releases, responding to press inquiries, owning website maintenance and content updates, owning social media updates, creating vetted listed of claims to be used across all communications, uh, establishing contact with and open information sharing with other emerging CUDs, and establishing regular communication with DPS on general CUD related business, and any other related future business for which the governing board wishes to delegate. I'll second that. I will send you the text. <laughs> <laughs> The only question I had had to do with, I'm not quite sure I understood the relationship, I think I heard you say DPS. Yes. And it, that, that sounds to me like an executive committee yeah. kind of relationship, and I'm not quite sure how it is the communication committee would it, sure. interrelate. Yeah, so we, we talked about this a little bit at the Business Development Committee, and it's largely around ensuring that um, there is a constant flow of information between the two. I, I don't think it would necessarily fall under um, executive business that needs to be attended to, um, but I'm, I'm certainly open to modifying this language. David, I, I think you were the one who proposed this. Did you have more thoughts on it? Was the conduit of information between, the, see, between us and them, that's what I was thinking. So, so I think if it's you know gathering uh, information, press releases, or or changes in their programs or whatever like that that we might want to publicize, put on the website and all that kind of stuff, that's good. As far as the communication between reaching out and and actually initiating something or something, uh, I think that's executive committee. That's fair. Or the board. The, oh, the board. I mean, however that's yeah, uh, yeah. that's done. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. And uh, actually, the context of this conversation or this point um, was, given that out town meeting, the number of CUDs is likely to expand. We're thinking that there might end up being regular, um, you know, forums for CUDs that interact with the state. And of course, you know, executive committee could take that on. But we were thinking that might be a, the right opportunity. So the one idea that we meant discussed was actually if. if <laughs> The consolidated number of CUDs had a, a, a website template that was similar for everybody and, and made our life simple and it would be useful. And some of the department should probably help coordinate. So that was part and, of it. And that's something you could hand to a DPS and they could then say, here, yes. everybody is agrees to this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Should we amend this particular point? I don't think so. What was the language? What did you say? The language was establish regular communication with DPS on general CUD related business. And the general there meaning not well, very specific business or, or whatever. Jeremy has one. So I was just going to say the other thing that, that I remember being mentioned was having um, consistent descriptions between CUDs, like what is a CUD, for example? You know, most people don't know what that is. You know, but some way, you know, someone asks you, what's this little, you know, what's a five word blurb you can say? A CUD is this. Yeah. Right. And that was the intent behind establishing contact with and open information sharing with other emerging CUDs. Yeah. Eventually, this is going to result in there being a league of CUDs in Vermont. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That will be a nonprofit. And we'll <laughs> there you go. Another and non there's layers. It's Another non profit. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you file the paperwork tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First executive director. <laughs> I mean, personally, I, I think leaving the communication with TPS, I, I feel like leaving it in there gives them the flexibility so that when those things come up, they have the ability to do that. I mean, anything where you know the whole district is going to take a position on something, I think that's got to come from the whole board and maybe and be communicated from you know. A, one of the delegates or from the executive committee. I think empowering them to go and reach out to um, you know, Clay and his folks over there and have that 
um, have those conversations as things start rolling. I think that I think it will make things a lot easier, personally. Okay. It seems to me that there's this big overlap, actually, between business development and, and communication. And so I'm just wondering why you want there to be a separate <coughs> or, have, or not have some formal communication between the two of them. Because in business, communication is really about developing business. It's not about getting information out. It's about developing business. So I can see where it develop, where the conversation started in the business development committee. But I would be concerned if there's not, not concerned is the wrong word, but I, I would be feeling better if there were some formal uh, relationship between develop, business development and, and the communication committee. Sure. Because you're really doing the same thing. Only one is more specialized in getting information out, and the other one is saying, well, what do people want? Yeah. And we discussed that, and that's where the idea of this committee would send representatives to other committee meetings all the time came from, because there has to be that open dialogue between the committees. Um, I would personally favor the idea of the communicate individual commu committees establishing what the needs are between them and establishing what that, that process looks like. But if you have a proposal for how to codify that in, in a little more structured way, I'm certainly open to it. So if you will recall about two or three board meetings ago, I presented a proposal that, that we divide business development committee into two entities or to, to or make subcommittee. We weren't sure how to structure it. We were thinking maybe subcommittees. So this sort of the reason we did that was we felt like yeah, it's intrinsic to what we do, but we're getting spread too thin. There's, we have too much on our plate, and and yes, the communications is really important, and yes, writing grants and going after projects is really important, and and we weren't sure we could handle all of it together. So having a dedicated, you know, I think probably the only committee you really need to send an emissary to for now is the business development committee. You know, you don't need to send one to the finance committee or the policy committee right now. But um, I, I think we need it. I, I, I agree that they're, in, they're, they're intertwined, but we couldn't handle all of it by ourselves. And so it was good to have some people dedicated to communications or outreach or whatever we called it before. Marketing, marketing, um, fundraising. As a member of the business development committee, I know the, the skills necessary for the communication, such as managing Facebook and Twitter, and that is something I have no interest in and no capacity to do and no <laughs> aptitude. Um, developing the content, which is the message that communications is, I think, what we wrestle with, and that's fine. But then taking it out and developing all of those connections which the communications group I've looked to them to do is, I think, distinct. Well, what Mike says is intertwining. And, and I think if there were two people from the Business Development Committee that were specifically on the communications and vice versa, so that there was. We have that. Yeah. No, but I mean, I don't mean unofficially. I mean that that's the way it was, that there was always two, there were always two people oh. from business. Interesting. On, on communication because I think there's going to be a lot more activity as time goes That's on in idea. business development yeah. and and you and, and so I would like to have a, a channel that was always there. Um, would you like to move to amend the motion? Um, <laughs> somebody would put it in language, but yeah, that that, that there be uh, um, amended so that there are always um, two people on the committee, although those two people don't always have to be at the communication, but that there, there are always two. And it looks like you have a big overlap anyway, but I think it should be formalized that there are So, so, two. so that, that, that's my question. Is this something that we need to formalize, or are we small and agile enough that we're going to be able to um, also talk to each other? Jerry? Yeah, I, I agree formalizing it is, is, is a good idea. I think it's happenstance this time that David would be on both committees, but I think a minimum of one person being on both committees 
is probably a good idea. The, the, the other thing, though, that the, that's really important that we do have to be careful of is burnout, because you can only attend so many meetings so many times, and there's a lot of work to be done by volunteers. So, you know, two people might be a good idea, maybe one person is sufficient, but I think that you know, mandating that overlap as a part of the both committees is, is a good idea. I, I think two is better in that, like you said, burnout. Sure. If you've got some person has to go to two committee meetings every day, I mean every week. Um, um, I think that should this group ever see fit to hire staff, I think having a communication staffer makes a lot of sense. A lot of nonprofits are structured in such a way that communication staff report or, or are members of the development team. And so here, it would make sense if that the communication staffer were, were to report or associate with the business development group. And if that were the case, there would be no need necessarily for a distinct communications committee. Um, that also said, you know, I've never seen a municipality create a committee and then that committee then subsequently and efficiently disbanded after a period of time. Once you create a committee, it exists forever, more or less. So, I mean, that's not always true, but, but in general. Um, so but doesn't I think, that more apply to paid people as opposed to volunteer people? I don't know, <laughs> but so you know, I, but it's something to consider if we if we ever do end up hiring a communications director or whatever we want to call them. Um, that might warrant there no longer being a need for a distinct communications committee. But that's I think that's a great point. Long-term planning that I don't know if we're prepared to handle right now. Good point. Planting the seed out there anyway. Planting the seed. So do we have an amendment on the floor with regards to adding that there's a requirement to have two members of the business committee on the communications committee? I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, that was it. Thanks. Because I, I even <laughs> jotting it down, I didn't know if it was better than I, I drafted some language for the work. Why don't you offer that rather than mine? Okay, so okay. We'll, we'll, we'll withdraw that motion. And Chuck, you want to? Um, the amended language would come after and any other future, uh, any other related future business for which the governing board wishes to delegate, period. Uh, business development committee must include a minimum of two people serving on both committees and members to include Andy Gilbert, Jeremy Matt. Uh, Ray Pelletier, David Healy, Susan Wirt, Wirtgen? Martin. Martin, okay, and Chuck Burton. Okay, I will second that amendment. So we're just voting on voting on and discussing just the amendment right now. Like a, a good, uh, hold on, hold on. More discussion? Um, just, ju just about the amendment. Sure. Um, Greg and I are on the liaison committee with WEC. That's a form of communications as well. Um, may relate to this function as well. It gets a little more complicated, but I don't know whether you want to include that. Because the, the, the idea of meeting with or contacting Department of Public Service is kind of a liaison thing. And that's the same thing we're doing with WEC and we might do with EC Fiber. We have different liaison, liaise, Functions in so, the board. So, so, so if we have, you know, you two as the dedicated WEC liaisons, and we have the, the more general communications committee that's going to be liaisons to everybody else, and we could easily, you know, pull something out of their responsibility and, you know, hand that to a different group of people, where you guys get tired, and we can take that responsibility and put it on the committee, or you join the committee, and that's your, that's your. You know, your level of responsibility. So you're suggesting that we don't need to expand the language further? I don't. I don't okay. think so. I, I I don't know that the juice is worth the squeeze. That's right. fine. <laughs> Anything else on the on the amendment? I, I think it was a little bit confusing. The, the language that I thought I heard was that in the business development committee we'll have two members. Business Development Committee must include a minimum of two people serving on both committees. Uh, yes. So you're putting the onus, as, as opposed to saying the Communications Committee will have two members from the Business Development Committee. You're putting the onus on the Business Development Committee to provide two members to the Communications Committee. That is how 
I'm, I'm not going to get too worried about who, okay. who has who has onus and who doesn't. I think we can. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, these are. going to say, not my job. No, no. He, I think it was. Whatever. Okay. So, so the, the the amendment was moved by Chuck and seconded. We'll say by by. Um, David and I, I thought I seconded it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, and then we were having we were having discussion on the amendment. So any further discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of amending Chuck's original motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Motion to amend passes unanimously. Now we're back on the original motion. Anybody want to talk about the as communications committee? As yes, amended. as amended. Wonderful. All those in favor of the motion on the floor as amended, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Again, thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Chuck. Anything else on this, on the communications committee? Um, just one point of business, which is I will coordinate a first meeting and get all that rolling. But at that first meeting, one of the agenda items will be to establish structure and all that sort of fun stuff. So oh, you're uh, the chair. What's that? You're the chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just elect him? <laughs> 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 let's let's move on. Um, there was a request to talk about website content and management, which I imagine some of which will come from the communications committee. I have an update there. Okay. Uh, so Jared and I met um, a few weeks ago. Um, he gave me an overview into the current hosting setup of the website, um, and I've hosted websites for years, so I can help assist him with that. And we also uh, established a little bit of a division of labor on populating content to the website. So in particular, agendas and minutes, but now with the communications committee being established, um, we're probably going to be looking to populate a bit more as we uh, establish vetted claims and fact sheets and things of that nature that might come out of it. So um, that's as much of an update as I have at this point. Um, I probably can't feel too many questions without Jared being here. So. I have, a, I have a request from the Assistant Town Clerk of Berlin, if we could post when our regular meetings are held and sure. where they're held generally. Um, she was going to put that in, their, in the newsletter, as it's held in Berlin. Um, she was not able to find that schedule. I mean, I sent the email in response, but it would be good to have that listed. Yep. Um, and actually, Nathan and I are working on that. Cool. He was going to create the calendar, and then I was going to publish it. <coughs> Up with him on that. But if we can just have just some language somewhere on, on the website that says regular meetings are whatever. Makes sense. Okay. okay. Yep. Do we have our grants posted up there? I think it's part of our grant policy that we have. Yep. We, we certainly can do that. We should, we should probably suggest that strongly to our website folks. <laughs> so we, we don't technically have that broadband innovation grant just yet. We're approved. It'll be signed in the next day or two. Um, that grant. Did I not? Uh, I did not put a grant report back. Okay, so while we're sort of randomly talking about this, um, you remember back when we had to wait and wait and wait about getting insurance coverage for the uh, Think Vermont Innovation Grant from the state, and then eventually they said, "Oh, you can request a waiver." Well, we did, and that was fine, and that worked. Um, it turns out that the DPS grant, the, the BIG, also requires that same sort of insurance. So I said, hey, can we just waive this? And I didn't hear anything. And David said, well, wait a minute. Didn't we get an insurance document from inter -Isle as they're going and doing this work? I said, you know what? Yeah. We did. And that was some yeah, I brought up in our office meeting that they had that. They went, but it was enough, enough coverage at the time. Mm -hmm. So, so they, and so I, I, I sent that to the state. I, I sent that to DPS, and I said, are we good with this? And I'm waiting to hear it, so hopefully okay. we'll do that, <laughs> sign it, and we'll get on with our life. Well, let me know if anything comes to that, and I can yeah. dive in deeper if I need to. Cool. Yeah, ho hopefully we don't need to do that, because uh, yeah. Fred and company are waiting for us to uh, pull the trigger on that grant so that they can get things going. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, WEC report back. Picked the wrong time to lean over, Michael. This is your agenda item. WEC? I'm sorry? Updates on WEC. Update on WEC. We didn't have a meeting. 
Yeah. You didn't. Okay. Any any new? I, I put it on here because this is something that we that, that came up in roundtable last time. I thought you might have had. If there's any sort of other updates. Last time we did. Yeah. Um, let me think if there's anything new to pass on. Fred had a question about WEC that maybe you can answer. Go ahead. He was just on Google Street View, kind of poking around the territory, looking at looking at polls. Mm -hmm. Does Washington Electric Co-op use narrower poles than, or thinner poles than um, Green Mountain Power, for example? No. No. Okay. So he he must have just randomly chosen the place where he was looking. The width or diameter is is also related to the height. So if they're shorter, they tend to be. Thinner. Okay. Right. Wicks so, a lot of short poles. Right. Okay. So, yeah. so that's, so the, that's probably what they're 40 foot poles or 35 foot poles, they're going to look now. Okay. So he was just get, trying to get a sense of what the terrain looked like here, and he, he noticed that. He mentioned to me that Green Mountain Power had an enormous number of poles that were put in in 1947. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he said they were real skinny. So. Okay. They're, they're skinny poles all over the Okay. I'm sure they're on a replacement. Yeah. 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 Sure yeah. Let's, 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 so, let's, so this is still there. Well, I worked for the, worked for the Department of Public Service for 30 years, and I know all about their plans. <laughs> so this is an interesting aside. It's not about my. Uh, I, this was a conversation I had with Fred, and um, he was. I told him that when you do a ride out with the utilities for make ready, that if the pole is on its last gasps that you can put the onus on the utility to replace the pole. And he was shocked because he said that's not true in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, if the pole is about to fall over but you're about to add to it, you have to pay for the replacement. And he thought that was the case in Vermont. Well, good. I'm glad you corrected So that was a really useful piece of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say so. Okay, anything else on WEC questions? Our liaisons. Okay. Uh, Mansfield Fiber report back. So um, I reached out and uh, I got a sort of nice pat on the head saying, "Have a nice day. Go talk, go talk to ValleyNet." However, um, that the outreach that I made to Vita. We have a representative from Vita here right now, um, Yoon Young Denny, who, is, who lives in our district, it turns out, wanted to see kind of what we were all about, what we were doing here. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit about expectations for applying for the, the, the up to $4 million Vita loan, um, sort of informally. And uh, she offered to come and visit the meeting, not to have any specific agenda item, but I, I figured while, while we have you here, if anybody has any questions or thoughts or so, so I, I have a question. Did you fill up the survey? Did you, <laughs> so you, you're, you're in a really good place to, to get improved service, too. Or, or you, yeah, you, you yeah. ask your husband to do that. <laughs> yes, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll fill out the survey. <laughs> so um, what would the interest be on a loan if we had one in the process right now? Um, so typically our um, interest rates are based on the cost of funding plus the risk based um, basis for each project. Base. Uh, for certain programs, we have a set rate, but this broadband expansion loan program, as you all know, it's new to um, for us. So this um, act was legislation passed this act last year. We quickly put together, our management put together a program. So um, this is brand new program for us. And as Jeremy mentioned, uh, Mansfield applied their existing, um, you know, company, and they apply for uh, the first broadband expansion loan program um, through Vita. It got approved uh, last year in November, and that time uh, the interest rate again. This is a risk basis uh, for file, and then their interest rate was uh, our cost of funding. Uh, we call it Vita Base which was at the time 5.75 plus 0.5%. Uh, so starting rate was 6.25. Okay. 
So that's the kind of the ballpark, and it's a, it's a variable. There is no fixed rate funding program. And typically for the broadband program, there is really, um, you know, the interest only payment for our first two years is deferred because it takes so long to build out uh, the system. So that's how the, uh, the loan program is designed at this point. How is the, uh, I think it was $550,000 in Act 79 to uh, ameliorate the risk for VITA, how is that applied to that establishment of interest or right. other, um, or is it just a way to feel more comfortable with giving a moment, period? That's basically the latter. So um, what the legislation, the, the bill did was basically they created a, um, they're going to set aside some money for possible loss because we think that this is a brand new program. It's typically it's a, to the community district union communication union district. Um, so it's a nonprofit. There is no really typically a personal guarantee because it's a nonprofit entity. So it's a high risk um, rated loans. So they, uh, what they did was they just going to, the Vermont legislator is going to give us um, money, pull of money to put aside it for the loan loss program. So that's how we are able to kind of mitigate that high risk uh, loan. So it doesn't affect the interest rate? It does not. So my assumption on the, on the loan is that, let's say we were lucky enough to get the $4 million. We're not going to draw down $4 million and start spending it right away. That It's kind of like a line of credit through which we can draw. It's going to be a more construction loan. Right. A yeah. little bit at a time. And we, we always start paying interest on the part that we've drawn down Correct. over time. Okay. Yeah. So interest rate will be only accrued based on the outstanding balance. I, I am a little shocked at the 5.75% your cost since municipal loans are what, 2%, 3%? Um, if somebody went to the bond market now because interest is so low, right. why is it five points? It's well, double. Our cost of funding is so high. So um, we don't really get any uh, funding from the state. <laughs> we go out and borrow our own money, so our cost of funding is quite high. And that includes our operating costs, too. So you go to a private, you're going to the private market? Yes, we do. Yeah, we are again getting money. And backed by the moral obligations from tre state treasury. So okay. what, what, one of the things that we have in the uh, feasibility study business plan expectations for inter -Isle is to explore different funding sources. So VITA is, is one option. And if you find that there's a bank or an investor or someone that's willing to take um, our district, which doesn't have a financial background to stand by, doesn't have a personal guarantee. Um, if we can find you know, someone else that's going to loan us cheaper money, then I expect we'll probably consider that. But the, the legislature, knowing that there are going to be these new entities like us that need to get to the point where we can start building something and eventually roll, roll this loan over into municipal bonds, we will only be paying that higher interest rate for, hopefully, for a couple of years until we then establish financials and establish um, revenues that we can reasonably you know, cover the cost of revenue bonds, which will be, hopefully, crossing fingers, you know, 2 3%. That's a lot of money, $6.25 on every $100 that you spend. Sure. It's also similar to how EC Fiber got started. That was about the rates that they started. Yeah, they were they were, they they were doing they were able to promissory notes of seven. No, they were higher than that. Yeah. 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 You, you, said, you said something about a moral obligation. Is the state providing moral obligation for the bond? Uh, for our, uh, yeah, for our bond, yeah. Which is basically a guarantee if something should collapse. Um, and I've done, used that in a $350 million project where we have moral obligations from uh, a couple of counties in Virginia, and it really impacted the interest rate. And I'm surprised that even with that, our cost of funding is so high. Yeah. Right, because we go out in the private market and we borrow money from the, the commercial banks. Right. Okay. So the application process takes how long? Uh, Application process, uh, meaning my, so there are two, two steps for you guys put together all the information that, that I would need or we would need uh, for underwriting. 
So once I have a complete package, um, probably because this is going to be, I'm assuming, a large loan, and also it's a new entity, a lot of information to um, to uh, underwrite. So probably it's going to take probably um, up to three weeks, sometimes three, three weeks, to four sorry. weeks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, so three months. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <Okay. laughs> Um, so a company like Mansfield Fiber, because you may not be able to speak to that particular loan, but a company like that, which is not a CUD, right. do, do they provide a personal guarantee because they're not, um, not a municipality? Right. So I can't speak uh, for specific for that project, but uh, typically if it's not nonprofit, it's a for-profit, and they're owners. You know, any owners owning more than 20%, really, we get the personal guarantee from that person. <laughs> Once in a great, you know, for sometimes we do make an exception for a good reason, but 99% we require personal guarantee from the owners owning more than 20% of the entity. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else oh, for you, Young? Okay. Well, we should thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank no, Person, four million. Personal loan? Uh, cut that in half. Seventy-five. Seventy-five. <laughs> so I cut that one a little bit more. Yeah, right. So, so maybe we can start with them, and then if yeah, we'll can, we're going to need our own money. I mean, we have to have yeah, the match anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. And the at the match requirement was five percent. What, what was the the, mat, the uh, match requirement? Was five percent of the overall loan? Ten percent? Oh, uh, based on the program, we can find it's up to ninety percent of the cost. So it's, a, so it's a ten. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. So <clears throat> let's move on to CB Fiber twenty twenty timeline, and this is um, kind of our opportunity, I think, to spend a bit of time and, and think about what does this next year look like. Make sure that we're all on the same page. So I don't know if anybody has any specific feedback about this or if I can just kind of go off the top of my head for how I'm imagining. Well, you have a contract timeline. Yeah. That's a good start. Well, that's, that's, that's part of it. But, that, but now that we know, like, there's a three-week turnaround with Vita once we get the materials together and so on. Um, yeah, so the, the contract with Interisle should be, we should have something at the end of May, right? We should be ready to go and have, hopefully have a, you know, shovel-ready business plan end of May. And assuming that we move quickly, maybe spend a week, if we don't already have the, the application in hand, I'd say maybe a week assembling that. And then we're looking at end of June, beginning of July, optimistically. Yeah, can I? Because one of the steps that's going to be necessary, we, we talk about it here, is the identification of specific project. In other words, I don't think Interrail is going to decide that the specific part of the region it's, it's in the contract, too. They're going to recommend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're going to make a list of recommendations. And it's, and it's, our de have, it's our decision. I, but I have, right, it is our decision. I have one. It's very challenging for me to believe that in a series of, let's say, four months, February, March, April, and May, we will have agreed that there is a specific location that CB out, yeah. Fibers is going to be building. <laughs> Plainfield. <laughs> I, because we don't... You know, we've only talked very generally about, and I, I know they'll be providing some of the technical information, but we've talked about the possibility of generating revenues from locations that is going to be beyond, beyond the work that Interisle does, the, and, and establishing what, if, if we talk about personal loans, okay, establishing what that mechanism is and terms. I have. So how can we have those conversations earlier on then so that we can be 
we can be ready and have a better idea of where to go from there. So uh, we're going to get interim reports from Interop. Mm -hmm. And one of the earliest one is going to be talking about some of these ideas. And that, so while they're doing their report, we are doing our own deliberations and feeding back to them and saying, this is what we're leaning towards or not. Hopefully we will. Um, I think that's how I imagine the process. But for that reason and others, I would say that no matter what the schedule is in the con contract, we should probably add two or three months because there are going to be unforeseen obstacles where they're going to have to just stop because they don't have the right data or there's some obstacles that are unforeseen, but I predict will happen. them. And so I think it might take longer than the roadmap might stretch out a bit. And I think it's realistic to let's hope we don't have any of those obstacles, but I think it's realistic to plan for some. And um, going back to Ken's issue, I think it's going to be the board's decision, I, and, but we've charged Interrail to make strong recommendations and give us reasons for those recommendations, data and explanations of how that works. And then we will look at those and, and either validate or, or disagree with their recommendations. And what about the status of WEC? When Very we're, important, yeah. Right, and they're, if they're pursue a grant from the state, they won't be awarded that grant until March, late March probably. Their process will also take three months, five Long, months? Even longer, yeah. So, six months? But, so, but theirs might be influenced by our decisions, too. Right. So if we're, if we're cognizant of what their requirements are, and inter is cognizant of those requirements, that can all be kind of fed together. And if they if they choose inter as a consultant, all the better. If they choose another consultant, if we ask Fred and that other consultant to liaise, to use the word again, um, <laughs> that can that can help that process. Jerry has something. Yeah, this is an excellent conversation and and, and a critical conversation and, and David and I started a little bit of, of this conversation just this afternoon. Uh, I think that, and not that we ever have been, but we certainly can't be now. We can't be passive while inter Isle is doing their work. So we're having regular feedback with inter Isle on a biweekly basis, if I, if I got this correctly, apart from presentations they make to the board, apart from deliverables, we, we have bi-weekly communications with them, and I believe we need to develop, and just as you're doing now with let's talk about the schedule for 2020, there are interim steps that we're going to have to figure out what we need to know in order to make decisions, because inter -Isle isn't going to have all of the information, even though we've, we've, we've put together this scope of work. It's, it's not going to ask every question that needs to be asked, especially questions among ourselves. How, how, how comfortable are we with moving forward with personal loans? How comfortable are we moving forward going through VITA? You know, we, we're, we're going to have to weigh that out, and we should be weighing some of that out in advance and not waiting for the results from from Interisle. So I, I think the, your, your, your point is really well taken. We have a lot of work to do. And in, uh, it's possible the trial will say here are two or three possible project areas for us to do, and that's an opportunity for us to then go to those areas and say, all right, who's actually signing up? Because we need commitments to be able to get any funding from any source. And to be able to point to, we've got a base amount of revenue that will come in. So that's, that's part of the timeline that we have to And to do that, go. do that as early as possible, as soon as we sort of decide that they're comfortable with an area, going and doing that legwork, I think, is going to make the project look better in the long run. Right. And do we know from EC Fiber's experience, when do we need the sort of legal support to begin to make uh, agreements to do, agreements to, to get customers to say they'll sign on, I'm imagining we're going to need legal support. When, and I don't know how they, if we've learned from them, as to when they develop some of those early agreements and how those were worked out. But I think that's somebody you want to reach out to Valley and ask that question? 
I mean, I, I don't, I, I guess I, I don't know how I would frame that question because I think there's a lot of moving parts. I mean, we, we did engage an attorney for the drafting of the, the contract. Um, that was, uh, it wasn't Paul Giuliani, but it was somebody else at his firm. And we expect that we will probably work with him when it comes to drafting the municipal bonds down the road. Yeah. Another um, example would be a promissory note. Promissory type notes. Thing, right? Yeah. Right. Or, yeah. And so he could draft promissory notes too. But if I mean, if it's promissory notes that that, that we're looking at, then yeah, there. I mean, we already have we already kind of know who's. I kind of think that we know who's going to do that. What else would we need to, what other sort of process do you think we would need to engage? Something about when we begin to talk to potential customers and ask them to commit what that document looks like that A, assigns our responsibility specifically and their responsibility. So a legal document for pre-subscriptions. Right, yep. Okay. You don't need to There also need to be contracts with vendors. Yeah, so, so Mike, Michael, do you sign up folks? Do you pre-subscribe folks? We don't. So is, are you? We, we may, but we're not doing that. Uh, we Cloud Alliance did. Mm -hmm. I probably could find those notes. They're 15 <laughs> years old, but I'll look. But um, what's what's going to, is it something going to change over 15 years? You're providing, I mean, it's a different, slightly different I'll, service. I'll look. I'll All look. Right. That would be, that'd yeah. be great. I, I, I imagine that Valley Net would be happy to share, EC Fiber would be happy to share um, what they used back when they were pre-subscribing well, people. I think Giuliani was on their board, but I, he may have charged them for those. I'm sure he legal, did. For that legal work, and so we, I don't know if he's comfortable with them sharing those documents. We'd have to explore that. The, the, well, I mean, I, I got all the promissory notes. Okay. I got those, those are, they made those public. That's true. That's true. I, I know exactly where they're filed at the department and the board. I can easily go in there. There we go. So, yeah, if, reference that. If, it, if, it's, if it's okay for us to do that, then yeah, and if you, want, oh, yeah. If you could collect those and share them, I would, yeah, I'd like to see them too. Okay. It's, it's also it's, possible to take a service agreement from Comcast and you yeah. just amend it saying, <laughs> This is uh, <laughs> you know, preliminary or conditional oh, upon being funded and being built. I mean, you know, there's a lot of oh, yeah. there's lots of service service yeah. contracts yeah. out there in the public domain. Yeah, I, I don't know that I want to use Comcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Can you use the Chuck? What do you think? Um, so, just another thing to point out: I, I actually think the legal will be less work than this, which is if we are going to start going to get pre-subscriptions, we have to put some thought into some of the pricing model and um, different packages or whatever that we would actually sell as a pre-subscription. Is there a business tier Is it versus a consumer tier and, and what have you? Because um, I can tell you right off the bat, I'd probably be willing to buy a higher pre-subscription package than my next door neighbors because it is my business. So I can I can write off some of that as a business expense eventually. And there's a lot of there's a lot of variables in there about you know who do we choose as an operator. That's going to dictate yeah. part of this. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, if we were to go with ValleyNet, I mean, they tend to want to stick with the prices that they have that that works. Um, but maybe Interrail comes back and says, you know, here's this you know, here's this alternative, and we're going to do this instead. Um, so yeah, it's uh, hard to say. There's a lot of there's a lot of horses and carts and getting them arranged in the proper direction is. And another one on that, if Interrail comes back and is proposing 25.3 with with wireless for some people versus you know 100 parity on fiber, that might even speak to a different pricing package. That's true. Uh, this is just this is a very broad-reaching and expansive conversation, but I think it's important to draw back to the actual timeline itself, and I'm I'm curious as to what our next steps are in, term, in terms of actually defining and outlining an actual timeline for this organization. So yes, I, I think it's it's taking some of these questions and I mean, so questions like like Chuck's most recent question, I, I don't think we can answer that. There's a there's a kind of a Gantt chart involved. Yeah. There's other you know critical paths that you know answer questions that we need to have answered first, and uh, in some cases questions that we don't quite know when they're going to be answered or how they're going to be answered. Um, so I, I think that's a that's a good question. I think a lot of this responsibility is as we hand off, 
you know, the signing of the contract with Interisle is we hand off sort of the care and feeding of Interisle to the Business Development Committee. I'm hoping that, you know, as you're as you're talking, you know, Jerry and David, as you guys are are talking and liaising with them. Um, they're going to be bringing those questions to us. Um, I don't know that we can, right this second, say, "Here's here is the entire timeline." But um, there probably are some higher level things that we can put in in the timeline. I just I don't know what, what they are right now. I mean, do you have? I wonder if this is something that we could put to the various committees and ask them to sort of aggregate what they think are the next, what the next 12 months, 24 months looks like. And then they bring those recommendations or, or those visages, whatever you want to call them, back to this, our next meeting or two meetings from now. And then we sort of aggregate all of the different timelines. And we, we should also consider, I'm just going to throw this out there, adding like a, a grants timeline in terms of application renewals or, or you know, major, like for example, the Rural Business Development Grant that we're reporting out on this month, the next LOI is due this Friday. So if we wanted to apply for this again at FY21, it's good to include that sort of information on the timeline too, arguably, or mm -hmm. I don't know, you could make it a digital timeline, you could click on it and then it would just, you know, there's all kinds of things you could do. And, and, I, and I think it was about a year ago, so Alan, you had put together a statutory timeline of all of the obligations that we have as a district and what we're expected to do in terms of uh, like uh, delivering the budget and the feedback from the, from the select boards and city councils or whatever. So I think um, that grant timeline, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think if we can just maybe sort of get, toss this over the over the fence a little bit over to business development and comms and ask you folks, if you want to come back to the next meeting with how you envision, you know, the, the next year, and then if anybody else has anything that they think is burning that we need to make sure that gets on that list, then we can add it at this level too. Like the the work product at the end of this grant process with Interim is a business is a is an actionable business plan. Correct. And it's not not that kind of business plan that's a bunch of words. It's a business plan with a bunch of tables and Excel interactive Excel sheets that that have you know um, capex and opex assumptions and all that. That's where you start throwing in the expected revenue from different um, rate plans. So. I think the committees can talk about what we want to see in those and 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 throw those to Fred and the team and say we're looking to see these kinds of results. Um, we're thinking maybe of this sort of rate structure. Maybe I don't know if we'll decide that or not, or whether the board would. So I, th I think we're gonna. I think we we shouldn't sit back and wait for this gift to come five months from now at all. We mm -hmm. have to. Right. We have to tell them what we're looking for constantly as we're going along. And, and that's what we're, I think that's what we're relying on the Business Development Committee to do as they shepherd him through that process. But, but go, going back to the, my first point, until we have that model, not the business plan, the business model, the, the Excel model, it's going to be hard to, to do a bunch of this. Um, we can use some existing models from others to play with. I'm willing to share, and um, and as a starting point, and then see what kind of ones they have and modify. Um, that's all. I really feel that we should be limiting ourselves to a, a small um, question rather than this, the the giant question. And I think you know you're you're sort of stating what I'm thinking that we we need to figure out early on how much money we're basically going to need in your 24 months, you know? Because we've been saying right along that we have to get up and going. We, we can't sort of start off with two people and then four people. We want to start off with 100 people as a number. I mean, mm -hmm. whatever the number is. And, and then so we need to use communications and business development and all the other committees as to 
well, where is this money going to come from, mm -hmm. and how much are we going to get? What's a reasonable amount of money? So is is CB fiber, uh, not CB fiber, is EC fiber? Are they sort of maxed out with their pricing? Is that the ideal sort of medium price that that people can accept? Is that what um, uh, EC fiber decided? You know that they said, yeah, that's. We, we tried this number and it didn't work. We tried this number, we didn't make any money, so this this one worked out. I mean, we there are lots of other people that can help us with that information. And well, the survey tells us how much people are currently paying. So we have a good range on that kind of number. From right, but they're district. paying for 15 meg or 30 meg or I don't even know what's your neighbor paying for. Well, gig it, so, 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 but, but the survey says whether they have consolidated or Comcast uh -huh. so or somebody who's smart about doing pivot tables can certainly tell you. Right, yeah. but what other? I mean, so Siobhan I, I, said at the beginning that you know her neighbor now has a gig, which means I'm a my neighbor, coworker. Okay, so you coworker. She's been promised to get it. I don't know if he's getting it. Right, but I, I know yeah. one person on. Front porch forum was bragging that they got a gig now. So that's it's happening. It's out there. Um, how much competition is there? And and so how much? What's our pricing that convinces somebody to not go with this this company and go with us instead? And and so I think that's really is the money. It's it's always the money, but it's really the money and. So I think what you're saying is that we, we need to concentrate on, e even if it's just brainstorming, what, what of these towns make the most sense to this group of people that we would start? And sort of, sort of has it a, as, a, as an idea, even before inter Isle comes back to us and says, yeah, you should start off with Marshfield or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, and, and we, we have done that. I'm not sure that that's a valuable conversation for the entire governing board to have. The Business Development Committee ought to be having those. But I think, I mean, ultimately, we're paying Interrail to do those sort of exploratory analyses for us in conjunction with with business development. And Greg, you had your hand up. Did you have something else? Well, yes, I was agreeing that, and, and that's something that we can do, is sample what are the rates of various providers, mostly in-state, because that's what people are going to care about. And then we can also look at some out-state, but who really cares what the rate is in Colorado? You know, so, uh, you know, we, we can collate that before we have our results from and our study from inter and be feeling, because in order for us to go out and be getting uh, even higher uh, interest from people, and then as we go into pre-subscription, we have to be quoting some pricing. Okay. Let's do a Jeremy Chuck Thomas. I'm Jeremy what people will pay depends on what level of service they have now. I would be willing to pay a lot more probably than someone who's in Barry City because Barry City has good internet already and I have not good internet. So just throwing that out there. Um, to react specifically to your comment around us potentially developing a plan of where we think we might roll out ahead of receiving in trials results, I actually disagree with that. Um, I think we are all fairly heavily biased in terms of where we think things should start. And, um, I think it, it would be a good exercise to specifically hold off on that and see what in trial comes back with. And you know, we may disagree with it when it comes back, but at least there, it's an objective outsider who is making that proposal. So that's just my two cents. Well, I wasn't suggesting that we decide. I was suggesting that we that we have ideas about what it is, so that when somebody comes back and says, "Well, it's Marshfield," well, we've already said, "Oh yeah, Marshfield's great. It's one of the five, or whatever." But if it's one of the seventeen that we've already said no to, then they're going to need to be pretty persuasive. But I don't think we should decide. That's. We can't do that. I wasn't implying that you said that. I okay. was I was saying I actually think it would be better to table that thinking even until we receive the results. Again, yeah, my opinion. Tom? I would, just wanted to, for sort of the business committee or, or the rest of the board in general, just kind of keep in the back of our mind that if we're going to compare ourselves against other services and what their you know, prices are, that we are not the same as them. We are a different entity. We have different scopes and timelines. And 
we don't have to think about how is this going to last 20 years from now, but rather we can be a little bit more thoughtful about what works for our local community and how can we arrange pricing, whether it's options for them or whatever, in order to make this work for us rather than as a business that competes against Comcast. I would, what he said, <laughs> one thing I was going to say, but I also wanted to mention that we have to keep in mind that right now my coworker got offered, he got a mailing that said they're offering one gig in your area for $40 a month. So he's paying $40 a month for a gig and they're doing the work on the lines outside his house. But he also knows in two years right. that price is going to skyrocket. Sure. So, so what they're paying right now isn't necessarily what it's going to be. So he's the one Can person I, who's going to get it at that rate. Right. So I can say that they yeah. Can I make a comment about a gig? So there's the technical gig and there's the marketing gig. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah, he knows gig? he's also not getting a whole thing right now. So Michael and John. Um, as you can imagine, I've done a lot of thinking about pricing. And, um, so I, I developed mat matrices of, of all the providers in the state and all their different plans, and I compared them whether they were fiber or coax or DSL or wireless. And um, in particular, I looked at Burlington Telecom and, and EC Fiber and, and similar organizations when thinking about what my pricing was going to be. And so I settled, I, my model said I should charge this because this is what it costs me and this is the margin of profit I need. But the prevailing prices were lower than that. And I knew that if I priced where I need to be, I would have a hard time getting a take rate. And so I had to figure out, well, okay, how do I cut some fat out of this so I can get my costs down? so I could get into the same range as those other companies. And some of them have you know, enormous buying power or they're subsidizing internet to keep their phone lines up. So you're playing against that as well. Um, anyhow, that experience I, I will bring to the committee and, and, and I'll share my matrix, uh, the latest one, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll use that. But and you don't have to have the cheapest price. You just have to have a fair price in that range. People will pay a little extra maybe if you're giving them local quick service that's decent on the phone and all that. Um, so there's all those factors to consider. Uh, we're a little bit in the weeds now talking about pricing. Um, yeah. But it's, it's an example of the kind of topic that we're going to have to pursue independent of Inderisle and then working with them. Jonathan? Uh, I respect everyone's desire to talk about pricing, but the warrant agenda item is about for focusing on the 2020 timeline. Thank you. Yep. So I'm wondering what our next actionable steps are in, in, in developing a timeline. So I, I still think that we need to pitch this off as a request to the individual committees and have them come back with something that they can that we can cover in the next meeting. Yeah. And that we can then all agree that this is the thing we need to do going forward. Do we need a motion for that or do we just need to proceed? I, I, don't, I, I think we can I think you can just take the prevailing wind here and, um, and sail with it. Do we have a uh, idea of how periodically we're going to have these meetings? Are we continuing to go at a two week rate or two and a half week rate or are we That's a that's a good question. Do we want to have another meeting this month? No. 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 <laughs> well, because the committees already have meetings. You know, it's going to be providing reports out to business development. It is in the contract for them to work with the business development committee. Um, and the business development committee will be shepherding them through the milestones and the expectations. Um, if the business development committee finds that there's a larger decision that needs to be made, I expect we'll all hear about it and we will win. Sure. Um, if we need to schedule a supplementary meeting because there's a decision that, need, that needs to be made, then we, we will do that. Um, I think we're going to get through everything on our agenda tonight. Maybe not as far through the 2020 timeline as maybe some had hoped, but um, we'll put that back in the agenda next time around, too, and expect that the business development and the communications committee folks will have some some feedback for us, Tom. Just to make sure we're covering our bases, we think about it the reverse way. Are four more meetings between now and May enough for us to get done what we need to get done? Pro probably not, I mean, honestly. Mm -hmm. But I think for this month, because this is right at the beginning of the process, I think we may need to reevaluate 
in February, and then in February we might say, wow, there's we just got a deliverable, or we're about to get a deliverable. We probably need to have a meeting you know, the day after or the week after so that we can go and have a chance to chew on it. So anything else that folks think needs to be added to the timeline that's not uh, terribly weedy? Microsoft Word has some great free templates for developing timelines that I strongly recommend. <laughs> They're really sweet. It looks very professional. That's all. Anyway. Maybe send, send, send the, the URL to that on the to, to sure. us from the Microsoft site. Sure. That would be wonderful. Thank you. That's how okay. I got that Russian document. Though, that one time. Oh, the templates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, there was a. Yeah. <laughs> this is the NSA. Uh, we, 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 we know Andy's a you know Russian operative, so it's all right. That's important. <laughs> Corey Chase is a Russian operative, though. Is he? Yeah, he's got businesses in Siberia. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, this guy actually speaks Russian and spent time in the Soviet yeah. Union, so. You see. Oh. All right. Yeah, we're, we're gonna let's go. We're gonna kill that right there. Um, Thank you. Uh, December meeting minutes. Uh, we're looking to approve those. Uh, thanks, Susan, for sending those along. One um, one thing that I noticed in this is that it just had the wrong date, and I already sent that <laughs> sent that to Susan. So our la the, that meeting was held on. Uh, December 10th, and the governing board meeting minutes show December 11th. So I suggest that we make, make that change. Is there anything else that needs to be uh, adjusted in those two pages that she sent for the December 10th meeting? So I'm going to make a motion that we approve those meeting minutes uh, with the one noted change. Second. Okay. So it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, so abstentions because you were not there. So a motion passes unanimously. All right. And we'll do a round table. Phil? Um, I just wanted I, I wanted to look up something as we were talking about cost for uh, bandwidth. I <clears throat> do a fair amount of work with schools around uh, E-rate discounting, and the last time I went out to, to, to bid for uh, circuits was for a school that was looking for 200 meg delivered over Ethernet, and Comcast wanted 819 a month on a 36-month contract. Okay, just to give you a rough idea. The consolidated was a little bit less. I think we can beat them. Yes. <laughs> were, were those dedicated or shared? Dedicated. dedicated. Just not that expensive. Yeah, that's what the market is. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's called price leadership. <laughs> oh, that, yes. <laughs> Consolidated was the price leader. Yes, I know. Yeah. So just a small update on possible, you know, new competitors. Um, to us and everybody else, that's uh, Starlink now has 182 satellites up in space, and they're projecting to be at about 12,000 satellites by the year 2020. Are they Geos or Leos? I oh, are Leos. Leos? Leos? Actually, it's 172, but um, <laughs> the, um, he says well, five more launches, he'll start supplying service to northern U.S. and southern Canada. So that's only, you know, four times, that's only, you know, 300 more satellites. So we'll have to keep our, to Starlink, keep our eye on that. David, they haven't announced pricing or SpaceX. I've been meeting with the Central Mount Public Safety Authority. Um, there is an overlap. They, they have dispatch, they have land-based mobile radio towers that are fiber-fed, they have horrible coverage, and so they are also pursuing maybe um, a feasibility study to determine how to expand their service. So I just wanted them to be aware, and hopefully they'll continue to, well, they will work with us, so that if they have some ideas about new towers um, and connecting dispatch centers in different ways, that the understanding of the fiber role in that will be clear, and maybe we'll find some synergy. 
So uh, last year sometime I applied for a grant from the uh, Founders Fund at DEIC, uh, which we did not win. Uh, I had somebody from the committee on that stop by today and said, hey, we're going to be putting out a new flyer on that, and you guys should really apply. Um, and they, they just, that was about it. They can tell me, but uh, they're going to post that, I think, next Wednesday from tomorrow. Um, so I'll follow up with Yeah, if you, can, if you can stay on top of that, <clears throat> hopefully take a crack at it. That'd be great. So this is really exciting that we're moving forward with the business plan and all the rest. I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for all the work that we all do, but thank you all. So. Uh, for the business development grants and communications committees, um, I just, to my mind, in our discussing reaching out to Bear Area Development, um, I know the Vermont Food Bank has generated a letter of support for a previous, previously submitted grant application. It would behoove us to gather any and all letters of support that are drafted because subsequent grant and or loan applications, we can just submit other letters of support. So I think we should just collect those. We don't have to put them on the website or anything, but it would make sense to make sure we keep tabs on all of them just to show that there is support from the business and nonprofit communities in Central Vermont. It's a great idea. We'll run with it. Whatever happened to, didn't, when they passed all this legislation last year with the VA program and this and that, they hired a dude, right? Yeah, whatever happened to that guy? What's he doing? He just started. He just got started. Just started. Just started. Last week, Mitchell and one saw me a little bit. And that's the person in communications yeah. will end up. Okay. Yeah, do, you, do, you, do you want me to we can invite him to the next meeting? Well, I mean, we'll, I, I, I we'll, do that. we'll work with him <laughs> through the communications, I guess. Who is it? Do you know him? Rob Fish? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, he should come. Yeah, why not? Yeah, he should. He should come. Yeah, if you know him, invite him. I, I don't know yes. personally. I know, I'm I happy know to reach personally. out to him. I know I've, already, I've already met with him and we'll meet with him again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, if, you wanna, basis. if you want to invite him, we'll add him to the next one. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Cool. Very well, well in this previous chart. Uh, <laughs> that's good. I, that was just. Still? No, I have nothing. Okay. Nothing. Sure. I'll just take the uh, opportunity to ask a question. When is our next business development committee meeting? I said that about a whole year. <laughs> I don't know. But it's not change. It's not changing due to anything that that has just no, occurred. May change roughly two right. weeks from now. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. If you could, if you could send that out to everybody, that would be Actually, the second week. No, you no, you did. I just. Oh, okay. You sent the. You've been warning on the year. Sent out a year later. You did. As a copy paste of a spreadsheet, you could you could send the yearly once a month. I could. Okay. Yeah, I've been following the satellite stuff, the satellite stuff too, and one of the things that I'm realizing is, I think at times we think we're operating in a static world where we have a question. Most of us, I think, automatically think, well, we can ask EC Fiber what they did. And mm -hmm. I think everything is about to change mm -hmm. in ways that might make wires an old model. It, um, it's going to make us look like a dinosaur and a lot of other people. One of the things that I realized about the satellite system is, if I understand it correctly, I would essentially be able to take my, to take my connectivity with me. Yeah. If I'm driving across the country on a camping trip and you always sit there. in a van, I, I'd have high-speed internet. It's 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 going to be like serious XM of the internet. You know, it's yeah. going to be everywhere, and, and you're going to have and more profitable, more profitable. Um, he did say that you could mount it on the top of your car. This is a movable antenna would be able to be um, mounted on a on a, on the UFO. top of your car. Huh? Pointable UFO is what he was. Yeah. Re 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 the, the, right. the other thing that I found really interesting is the good news about this system is it's supposed to work better in rural areas than urban areas. It's sort of the flip of what we have nor normally have gotten used to in, in the build out of high speed internet. And that's because apparently in urban areas, as you can guess, there are many more blockages, tall buildings or and whatever. Congestion. And so it's actually places 
that are more urbanized and bigger cities that they're worried about coverage, not so much because of the number of people, but because of the actual physical architecture that's there. Whereas in rural areas, the only thing you have to worry about is having some sort of open space to the sky. Maybe we should have the VR operator. Well, <laughs> just get a satellite for us and put it right over Vermont, right? No, um, they're, uh, they're in orbit. Yeah, it, this is going to be very interesting, I think, in the, in, in the next year or two. And it's, it's going to make, um, Six months. I think it's going to mix things up. But that's, okay. that's all. Buy local. I, I'm not going to buy, I'm not giving Elon Musk my money. Okay, I already have it. <laughs> Come on, you're an Elon Musk junkie. Come on, no, admit it. I am not been. There's like four junkies here. I'm driving an electric car. But yeah. Okay, oh yeah, when are you buying your but Mustang? Something like this, I, I don't know the technology well enough. I don't know how fast they can actually go. I know that I had satellite internet at my house, and I don't have same. it anymore. It's not the same. It's, it's not different. the same. It's, it's completely same. different. No, it's going to be fast. Different. You promise me it's going to be fast. I'm not promising. Uh, I'm not going to have latency <laughs> like it. Uh, it's not going to go out when the weather's bad. No, I am unconvinced. I want a wire to my house. Okay, good. <laughs> and that's sound like a custom. You just sound like a gasoline driver. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's going to trade that I already jumped in on it, on it, but I think that it's a very valid point that what Alan says, Alan, what you say, that it's going to be a huge um, change. It's going to be, it, wires do go away. You know? I mean, the phone companies are going to find themselves out of business anyway. And, and uh, if Elon Those Musk puts up 42,000 satellites, then you will have satellite service in, in a tunnel. So, you know, it's not. What we're talking we're about not is in a tunnel. tunnel. And, not in a tunnel. And I think that the. Huh? Not in a tunnel. Tunnels one place, it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> a satellite won't okay. work, but. Uh, it, interesting. Right. So, right. Something, something that we need to keep our eye on yeah, clearly. Right. clearly. Right. right? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. No. Fiber to the cow. Thank you. <laughs> right. Fiber to the cyber truck. Yeah. That's all I have. I move the, I move the picture. Second.